So good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see a turnout this morning. And uh, we got a little bit of a different uh, slant on our topic today with uh, Al Hurt. And many uh, know Al from the Facebook forums that uh, we have discussions on. And uh, I must say, uh, Al has a quite a high reputation for his photography. And uh, actually, I thought he was a professional photographer, but he tells me that this is a started as a as a hobby but he's got all every toy in the book by what i've seen and uh not only does he have all the the professional equipment but he's got the professional knowledge so uh, his uh, road track is is uh, labeled the camera bag and uh, we're going to learn why in just a minute or two because uh it's just amazing uh, the work that al has shared that i've seen on facebook and uh He's going to uh, give us some uh, tips and tricks on how to take good photos. Uh, and uh, as Al and I have talked before, uh, it's not the price of your camera that uh, gives you a good photograph. Often it's the photographer behind the camera that has more influence than uh, the equipment that you're using. But uh, it, it's so great to have a good turnout here. And uh, Al, we're going to turn it over to you and uh, really looking forward to you sharing your your knowledge and your experience with us. Thanks so much for taking your time to do this. Oh, thank you, Doug. Uh, I, I enjoy teaching photography. It's it's kind of a passion of mine, second only to taking pictures. At, at first, it was just going to be about photography, and I thought, you know, our road trips really support our hobbies. Uh, in my case, you know, our rig is called the camera bag. It's uh, in the photography community locally everybody knows the van and hey there's the camera bag so your rig can really boast who you are so i i split this up into uh sections uh, i did a survey on the uh, road trek site uh about what hobbies people use their road treks in we'll, i'll show you our rig and how we use it and then we're going to talk about how to take pictures So these are some of the hobbies from our group. And as you can see, it's quite a lengthy list. Uh, some things I never, never thought about. Um, you know, uh, one gentleman said he loves taking his rig from uh, state to state to the different breweries and drinking beer. I thought, well, you know, that wouldn't be bad. <laughs> There's many a night of beer would have been good. Um, but as you can see from this list, it, it's long and involved. And of course, the last one on the, on the right bottom, that's what I do. I use my rig for photography. Okay, so our rig, or I'm sorry, the types of photography that we do with our rig is uh, you know, just a, a hodgepodge of everything. And uh, our road trek allows us to go places and stay places and do things that we wouldn't normally be able to do. Um, the green picture in the bottom middle is taken from a place called Steptoe Butte in the Palouse. It's a rolling area with this one, looks like a great big pimple in the middle of it. And we're able to park on top uh, and stay the night there. Now, we don't advertise that because you're not supposed to, but, you know, it's the rig allows us to do that. In fact, getting up there, uh, most RVs cannot make it up to this spot, but we can because of the size of our rig. Okay. The camera bag, we got ours in 2019. Uh, bought it in Garland, Texas. We live in Seattle. So our first time driving it was from Garland, Texas to Seattle. We learned a lot over that distance. Uh, it's been used as a camera bag ever since. Uh, we've got, we bought it with 114,000. It has run great. We've both got 176,000 on it now. And, um, excuse me, and it's just performed flawlessly for us. Right now, we bought a new house and we're trying to get organized, but one of the requirements was 
having a garage that we could park the, the rig in. Figured it needs a little TLC, you know, from, from time to time. So it's it's parked in the workshop now. And where we're living in Coos Bay, Oregon, uh, the predominance is the wife kicks me out every night at sunset. And I can drive within 10 minutes to some of the most beautiful coastline in America. It is phenomenal to live here. Uh, every, every winter we go on what we call a, uh, a winter wandering tour. Uh, this year, because it is a brand new place we're living in, we're gonna stay the winter. But we take the rig and we travel to just allows us not to have a, uh, a schedule. We don't make any reservations or anything like that. Uh, okay, now here's how I store my equipment. I've got two tripods, let's see, two tripods here behind the driver's seat. And then I throw my uh, laptop in behind that. The laptop is the modern dark room, uh, you know, with all the electronic photography nowadays. In the, uh, the hanging closet is where I store all my, most of my equipment. Uh, I've got a bag of lenses. I've got a, and then I use totes. These three totes uh, carry the rest of my minimum, the minimum amount of my equipment. And I know everybody always asks, well, what size is that? What fits there? So they're hefty 15 quart totes. Uh, in the back overhead, I've got this uh, one side. I've got a couple of boxes uh, stacked back in the corner. That's my light painting, which is a type of photography. I have light stands laying here. I've got uh, a couple of, of uh, heads for my tripods. As you get into this hobby, you begin to acquire equipment. We get what we call gas. Uh, I have a very bad case of gas. It's gear acquisition syndrome. Uh, you know, most every hobby's got that. Uh, up front uh, is my office, my dark room, my shooting location. So I built a table that I could use up front. And as you can see, as I turn the passenger seat around, it becomes an office up there. Also with that seat turned around, I can, I, I shoot from that position. I like uh, astrophotography, which is taking pictures of deep sky objects like planets, nebulas, um, star constellations, the Milky Way. And a lot of that is done in very clear skies. Well, in the Pacific Northwest where we live, Clear skies usually mean very cold temperatures to us. So if I'm gonna spend the night out in a zero degree Fahrenheit weather, uh, taking pictures, uh, you know, we used to do it in a car and blankets and that just never worked out. So with the, with the road trek, I can turn the seat around, the heater blows on my feet, uh, the stove is, very close to an arm reach away. It's about six inches. I have to kind of get up to do that to make my coffee and cocoa and hot drinks. And I can sit there in that chair. It's tipped back. It's just like being in your lazy chair at home. And if you look at the picture on the right, that's the view I get out the window. You can see we're in the workshop at the moment. But uh, where that stove is, or that uh, barbecue is setting is usually where my tripod is. So I can look out the window, set inside, and watch my camera do all the work. Uh, I can even uh, tether uh, to my computer. So what I can do is bring cables in. I don't have them in, the, in this picture. I took this in the workshop. Uh, but the cables come from my camera into the van, I plug one into the dash to run the battery for my camera, and the other one I plug into my computer. So now my computer runs my camera while it's outside. So until the, the camera runs out of uh, memory space, I don't have to go outside. So I control everything from inside. I can sit here and be toasty and warm. And like I say, it allows me to do 
photography that most people suffer for. Also inside, we've put in uh, red LED lighting around the top. Uh, and I did that for night vision for doing night photography, but you know, it's really nice if you get up in the middle of the night, there's just that little red glow that you can see. Okay, that's the rig. Were there any questions about how we set up the rig or? Okay, this is the part that I struggled with mightily because um, being a gearhead, I can talk about apertures and shutter speeds and ISOs and on and on and on, but that's not really what taking pictures is all about. Every picture tells a story. This is the advice I was given many, many years ago. And you've got to decide what is the subject of your story? You know, you see a lot of people that there's a little tiny road trek in the, down in the bottom and this great big picture around the outside. And they, you know, the comment is, see my road track. Well, the road track is so small in that picture that you can't see it. So you've got to decide, what are you taking a picture of? What's your subject? Is it where you are, you know, the landscape, the location, um, what your activity is? Are you skiing? Are you uh, playing on the beach? What, what are you doing? Uh, is it the sky, you know, like a, a gorgeous sunset? You know, how do you position your rig so that you catch the sunset, but your rig is the main part of it? Um, is it the lighting, you know, some weird light on the clouds or landscape? Is it the colors, the, the vivid green of Ireland? Or uh, is it textures? Uh, we've got rocks here leading, you know, going into the sea that have got just phenomenal little, looks like toadstools or textures of different kinds. So what are you taking a picture of? That's the, the thing to stop and think about. Why am I doing this? Why am I clicking? Uh, am I just documenting? You know, I went went here, I went there, I went the other place. Um, you know, that's a documentation thing. You might as well just take a sign of the each campsite's uh, sign as you pull in. And the, uh, the last thing is to make sure you show only what's important to your story. Like I said, you see pictures of a little tiny road track and this great big huge forest around it. What's important in that picture? If it's your road track, it should be big in the picture. And, you know, the background should be just enough to show you where you are. If it's a picture of just where you, you know, the, the, the area, then maybe you don't even need your road track in the picture at all. So we're gonna go through some examples here because I know this is a, it's easy to say and it's hard to visualize. So these are some pictures I've taken to kind of help get what we're talking about. Um, you know, a lot of pictures are like on the left, uh, kind of pulled way back. I got to get the whole rig in, got to get all the scenery in. But really, if you look at the picture on the right, that, uh, that tells you the same thing, but you can see more of where you are. You know, I call it change the angle and get closer. Um, the sunset on the right, you know, is great. But if you look at the one on the left, it's got the same impact, just doesn't have all the sky. So now the rig plays more prominently in the picture. Again, uh, this Skip Hoyt uh, joined me up at Mount Rainier. He was on his, I think he lives in New York. Um, but we got together up at, at Sunrise Visitor Center at Mount Rainier. And here's a couple of pictures I took. The one on the left shows the mountain, the Milky Way, and I, I did some Photoshopping on it. The one on the left talks about two rigs getting together. So by changing the angle that you're looking, changing how close you get, 
It changes the story of the picture. And you don't need to have the whole van in the picture. This is a, a very common mistake. Um, I, I was talking to Doug earlier about this and he looked at the picture on the left and he says, wow, look at that. It looks like you just waxed it. But if you look at the back corner here, you can see the dirt running off the back of the van. <laughs> so your angle can make you look better or worse as the case may be. Uh, the one on the left, on the right, here again, I didn't need the whole rig in the picture. In fact, I probably could have taken a little bit more of it out. But this picture was taken at an angle where there was a light in front of the van that would have blown out the Milky Way. So, uh, you know, I just moved around, got in closer to the van, got rid of the light that was destroying the picture. Here again, change your angle. Get in close. You don't have to have the whole van in the picture. You know, do you want the sun or the moon over your van? Um, the one on the right was just in a parking lot in uh, eastern Washington. The one on the right is the moon over the top of the van. I was down on the beach in uh, Astoria. I'm sorry, in Warrington, Oregon. Here again, what's important to the picture? Don't put a whole lot of extra in. Make sure your topic is prominently featured. Everybody asks about sun stars. How do you do sun stars? To do good sun stars, you need to have a camera that you can adjust the aperture on. Um, the aperture is, is the opening opening of the uh, lens that lets the light in. If you make it very small, it'll bring out the rays of the sun. The other thing about sun stars is that you it refracts off the edge of something. So in the picture on the left, it was the light coming through the trees. I was able to move, move my camera up and down, right and left and, and get just the right place so that it, it refracted out there. The one on the right, I used the edge of the van. I just squatted down until I got the light just peeking over the edge of the van. Um, that's, how you, that's how you do sun stars in a nutshell. Now understand I use professional camera equipment. Cell phones are a different thing. I don't shoot cell phones, I shoot, well, you know, I've got the big cameras. So it's uh, I, I, all kinds of adjustments. And if people want to get into all that, we can, a, you know, offline or at a different place. Sunsets. Um, you know, zoom in. Don't, you know, use your legs, walk closer or walk back, whatever you need to do. Moonsets and sunrises. Uh, here again, talking about getting rigs into places. The picture on the left, well, both pictures were taken at Big Ben Ranch State Park in uh, Southern Texas. It was 33 miles of gravel washboard to get to this place. So it took us a little over three hours. I think it was three and a half hours to get in there. Um, but the sky was crystal clear. There was no moisture there. Uh, this is the only place I have ever been where you can see stars when the moon is out. And I took this picture. The picture on the left is about the sky. That's the main thing. I put my van in there just to give an idea that we were out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody else around dirt roads. Uh, the one on the right, uh, a little bit later, the sun started to come up over the, uh, over the horizon, over the mountains there. So why not keep the van in the picture? 
here again, don't have to have the whole rig, just a part of it, because it's it's adding to the story of the sunrise. Nights, uh, you can take a picture if you've got the equipment to take night pictures. Uh, the picture on the left, I was walking back from a shoot and into the park and there was a light behind the van. I looked at that and I went, wow, that'll make a picture. So I stopped, set up my gear and took the picture. The picture on the right is the van with the Neowise Comet, which the Neowise Comet just came through earlier this year or last year. And uh, I was up in a parking area with about 30 other photographers and I, I bore very easily. I've got to see new things all the time. And uh, you can only take so many pictures of the comet over the mountains. It did not move that fast through the night sky. So I started looking around for other ways to take a picture of the comet. I backed up and says, hey, I can put this over the top of my van. I don't know how many people have a picture of a comet over their road track. So I backed up put the road track in the picture and away we went. So keep the possibilities open. I mean, always cast around looking for something a little different. Um, in your pictures, create life or activity. In this, this pair, if you look at the one on the right, the lights in the van are out. The one on the left, the lights are on in the van which, you know, you're, you're creating a little life with the lights on. It shows you that there's somebody there, something's going on. The one on the right was okay, but I, I personally like the one on the left. <laughs> Always keep thinking about how can I do this different? What makes it, what tells my story? Uh, incorporate people. And I'm not talking about lining them up against the van like you're going to shoot them. Uh, get candid shots because I do all photography work. Uh, these are a couple of people. The one on the right, I think, is Skip, uh, Skip Hoyt from the East Coast when we met up at Mount Rainier. He was taking pictures of the Milky Way. The one on the uh, left was a young man I'm mentoring in night photography and we just got up. And he was getting ready to take pictures of the sun's rise. Hotel parking lots. I know there are people that go out and boondock for months on end. Uh, we aren't like that. The wife and I like a few comforts now and then. And we like a good shower. So every couple of nights, we'll go to a hotel. Uh, you can take pictures from the hotel parking lot. The one on the left was from Galveston, Texas. There was a storm getting ready to blow up. So the next morning we, you know, we thought we were going to stay for a few days. The next morning we got driven out of Galveston by uh, 70 mile an hour winds and driving rain. The one on the right is in Bakersfield, California. You know, Bakersfield does not offer a lot in the way of what you'd think of, uh, beautiful landscapes <laughs> or sunrises and sunsets. But we parked the van and I walked out to get something out of the van. I says, wow, look at that. So Bakersfield had beauty. Uh, foggy mornings, you know, uh, we'd been shooting. By the way, the background on the left is, is Mount uh, St. Helens in Washington state. We'd been shooting at night, the fog started rolling in, got up the next morning, this is what we saw. So, you know, when I look back at that picture, I remember that night I shot as long as I could until the lenses all fogged over and had to call it a night. Everything was really drippy in the morning. The picture on the right, we went to uh, take a picture of an abandoned homestead uh, got within a mile and a half of the homestead and they closed the road. So we parked a van, took a picture, drove 30 miles around to get to the other side of the road closure. 
which was a quarter mile from where we wanted to go. So, you know, every picture tells a story and every picture is an opening for you to talk about what was going on then. So make it so that you've got a story to tell. Uh, in photography, there's what we call warm light and cool light. These two pictures are done in warm light. We, uh, we warm the picture up so everything is nice and soft and feels good. Then you've got cold light. Uh, the picture on the right here was taken the same time or the same night that these two pictures were taken. Here again, the picture on the left tells a story. We're there for the night to take pictures in, of the mountain. The picture on the left talks about the fact that we had to go down this little tunnel in the snow to find a place to park. We'd driven by this spot, went on, on down to the end of the road, turned around, came back to this spot about uh, three hours after we'd first passed it. And in that three hours, they'd come in here with a snow plow and plow this little area out. So when they came back to finish plowing the next morning and we were parked there, they went, holy cow, how'd you get here? Can't do this with a, with a big rig. <laughs> it's just not possible. Now there's-, there's Al, Al, could I just ask how, how do you do a warm or a cold photo? Is that a- something you do when you adjust your camera at the time you take the picture or is that something you do in your computer during the the post uh editing uh yes you can you can you can set your camera uh to change what they call color balance um i like i say i don't do cell phones but i know cell phones have a pro setting and if you go into the pro setting you change the color temperature of the picture. Um, if you think of fluorescent light, it's very harsh, very green. Um, if you think of, of uh, a cloudy day, the warm is very, the light is very warm in color, very neutral. So I always play with it in post-processing is what we call it you know, developing the picture in the, in the laptop. So yes, it can be done both ways. Okay, uh, maybe we should just ask if anybody has any questions at this point. If you do so, uh, press your space bar and that will toggle on your microphone. You can ask your question. Uh, or if you're too timid to uh, ask it in person, you can throw it in the chat and we'll see it there. Anybody have any uh, comments or questions so far? No, I don't see any. So you're doing a good job, Al, uh, by the by the looks of things. So carry on. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Um, there's picture. You know, when you look at a picture, there there's standard pictures like you know nothing's been done to them other than developing them, or there's what they call photoshopped pictures. Uh, same picture, I just processed it differently on the right. Uh, I put it into the software and, and changed a few things, desaturated it so that the colors are more muted, uh, sharpened it a whole lot so it's crunchier. Same place, same picture, just processed differently. Then I I do what's called altered reality. The picture on the left was the original. The picture on the right is what I was able to do with it. Uh, a little difference, you know, I changed it from a, a day to a night. I desaturated it and added a big moon and stars in the sky. So er, when you look at a picture, it taint necessarily the way reality was. But it also is amazing uh, the detail on the right in that mountain that on the left it's washed out and you wouldn't even know that detail is there. That's true. Uh, 
Um, here again, this was the start of our winter wandering tour last year. I parked the van in one place and took both these pictures about a uh, mm, half hour apart, maybe not that much, 15 minutes. Here again, what's the story? This one on the right is about the sunset with the lighthouse. The one on the left is, you know, a new use for our road tracks. We can be a lighthouse. <laughs> Um, in traveling, we went to the Alabama Hills and I'm old enough. I remember the Lone Ranger and he used to come down the Canyon at the start of every adventure. And, you know, uh, so we found the Lone Ranger Canyon where this was filmed all that, you know, back in the fifties, this area, the Alabama Hills in California is uh, a big movie set. They, they film many different movies back here. It's a great boondocking area. Uh, nobody bothers you back in there. So in order to get the picture on the left, um, I wanted the van right where it was parked in Lone Ranger Canyon. I found a road, walked around and said, oh, I can get around the side, around behind this big rock that is on the right side. So first thing we had to do was run the rig between two great big boulders with about a half inch clearance. And unfortunately, in that position, I wasn't able to get out of the van to take a picture of how tight it was. So we went around behind the great big boulder and the picture on the right, I stopped when I saw this, went out, scoped it, drove through it, and then came back and took the picture. Um, understand we come from Alaska. We've been driving two wheel drives in Alaska for a long time. We know a little bit about entry and exit angles and that kind of stuff. So don't try that at home unless you know what you're doing. So this is, this is photography. This is the story. Um, you know, and, and as you get into it deeper and deeper, uh, you could be going down a rabbit hole. So, um, are there any questions? Harris asked a question. Uh, is your van lifted to allow you to get into some of these remote places? No, it is not. Uh, I, it's, there were a couple of years there when they had different springs under them. And they seemed to have just a little bit more clearance. I've got... Uh, about eight inches of clearance under the van. Is okay, Mike has a question. Go ahead, Mike. That was great. I really enjoyed that. <clears throat> I have a question for you. I, I like to print. You know, at home, I have a wonderful Epson large format printer, and I've toyed with the idea of finding something that can make a decent print that's smaller that I could travel with. Have you figured that out? Uh, no. Now, I, uh, I do most of my work, I, I do it online. Uh, I, I put it out to Instagram and Facebook. Um, I haven't printed that much. Uh, well, I did in, at the studio at home, but I don't print on the road unless I go to like a Staples or somebody like that, uh, Office Depot, you know, and have, a, have them print it. Okay, thanks. Sandra is asking uh, a question. It's kind of off topic. So uh, we don't want to spend a lot of time because this is a photography uh, session. But she has asked about your winter setup for water. If you just want to make a brief comment on that. Uh, we don't want to wander off topic, though. Sure. Uh, as far as winter and water goes, uh, we drain everything, and we've just got some one-gallon water jugs that, like you buy in the store. We keep four of them in the van. Okay, and uh, Char has another comment. Uh, she's got a 92 uh, Chevy 210 Popular. Um, she, somebody told her that hers was not tall enough to uh, go off-roading. And uh, then does Marilyn help choose your locations? Uh, and she's a navigator. 
Yes. Uh, Shar, you're right. You probably don't have enough road clearance. Be careful. Uh, we visited Shar in Arizona one time, and uh, she's got a a 92. And I think if you look, you'll see that the springs are probably sagging on that rig, Shar. Uh, that's that's an older rig. Um, and yes. Marilyn does help to a point. Uh, she tells me when it's time to leave and go back to a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the other uh, comment I would throw in is that uh, I think it's well known that the Dodge units generally have a higher uh, ground clearance than the Chevs. So, uh, and you may have expertise on this as well, Al, to share. But if you, if you think you're going to be going off the main roads, uh, the Dodge does have a little bit more ground clearance uh, to allow that. Well, the other thing is the Dodge has a shorter wheelbase, which makes a lot of difference. There's what's called a rollover height. And um, that's a, a height that you calculate uh, in four-wheel drives by figuring out what hump you can go over. So it's measured as an arc between the front and back axles. And that's a, that's a different height. You know, you have X amount of height, but if you're going over a bump, you know, your front and rear tires can be low with a rock in the middle. And that's what usually gets 90% of the people. Very good. So any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, um, perhaps Al, you could share your your exposure information when you're including the sky, the night sky, into a photo. Just rough it out. Okay. Um, so different, you know, the ground and the sky. Yeah, they're they're longer exposures. Um, if I'm shooting Milky Way, I start at um, 20 seconds, ISO 3200. Uh, aperture wide open for whatever your lens is. I uh, okay. use that as a starting point. Uh, that will get me enough light in the sky that I can see the Milky Way. From there, I can adjust the camera, compose the shot, and then dial in exactly what I want for that exposure. Okay, thanks. That's the starting point. Okay. Uh, Simon has a question. I'll let you come on and ask it, Simon, regarding uh, film versus digital. Maybe you can uh, expand on your, your question a little bit. Hi, good morning. My name is Samson. Um, as a guy who started out with film all of my life, I, I've held off from the whole digital world for a long time until I kind of was forced my hand when photo finishers stopped processing my film. How has that really <laughs> changed um, kind of your view of photography and in particular, astrophotography, I understand, I mean, a lot of what we do now could not have been done without digital technology. Yes. Um, I got my first view camera when I was eight years old. My dad gave it to me. And I, I resisted the digital and resisted it. And uh, the wife came to me about five, six years ago and said, look, it, you're too damn old to work anymore you're going to retire, we're going to travel, find a hobby, and I don't care what it costs. So, of course, you know, for, she didn't like the girls, the gambling, or the drinking, so I went to photography. Now she's kind of thinking it would have been cheaper <laughs> to go the other way. Ah. But digital, uh, do not hesitate on digital. It has opened up the world, um, the process. It used to be 70 to 80 percent of your picture was done in the camera and that last 20 to 30 percent was done in the dark room you know with dodging and burning we had little paddles and it, it was quite a quite a process to get a picture and you could not with the films that we had uh the emulsification the um the coatings on the films we could not get high enough iso to be able to shoot night shots 
unless you're shooting multiple shots and then stacking the negatives, which was an extremely long and tedious drawn out process. Now I can go out, I can shoot uh, Milky Way. Um, I put the camera on a tracker, I get my one minute exposures. I'll take maybe a hundred or 200 of those, bring them in to the software, stack them, and it does all the noise reduction for me and brings out my detail. It is phenomenal to work in astrophotography today. So you're, you're doing multiple exposures for the sky at night? Uh, yes, that is to reduce the noise. If I'm running okay. at a, a high ISO, say I'm running a 3200 or a 6400 ISO to get my colors and everything right, I get noise. So in order to get rid of the noise, you take multiple pictures, multiple exposures, and then stack them in the software. And when it stacks them, because each exposure is off just a little bit, you know, this night sky is always moving. Right, it's always moving. Well, actually, it's not moving. We are. <laughs> And so as it moves, now when the software brings it back together and aligns them, now all those little noise specks are gone because they aren't aligned. And you're doing that in Photoshop with layers? Uh, I actually have several other programs I do, I use. Um, one of the best ones is free. It's called Sequator. It's S Equator. Is the way it's written. If I may, I, I, um, I ran into a lot of similar situation with you. It's always nice when you're traveling to have something tangible to give your new friends just a, something to remember by. And just sending a link to an email, it doesn't quite cut. It doesn't have that immediacy. It doesn't have that yeah. tangibility. So I actually ran upstairs to my office. And I, if you can see my screen, I've, this is a bag I carry with me. And it's several years old now. But... Uh, I know they must have newer ones and better quality ones, but this little machine puts four by six prints, well, and it's made by Canon. And uh, they they have several. I'm sure, like this is about eight years old now. But what it does is it generates four by six prints, runs on batteries, it's rechargeable, ah. and it comes in cartridges that you can insert right here. Sorry, give me bear with me here. Um, so it comes in packs of 50 four by six postcards. You can do the, those little sticker prints. And for me, I mean, as a photography guy, they're not great, but it's dye sublimation is a four color process and it takes about a minute to print a picture. So that's something you can look out for. Wow. Uh, Canon makes a bunch of them. And for me, it's just handy. Just have a little bag like this. Yeah. I keep it in the van and I have something tangible and small that I can... I can, if I have a card, I could uh, do a demo, but I don't have it right now. But uh, something to look out for, it's made by Canon. That's good, Simon, that's very interesting. I know that uh, I see Ed on here with quite a nice photo in his uh, virtual background. You wanna share that? Ed, is that something you may have taken? Uh, uh, yeah, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, that's actually <laughs> the Mississippi River from downtown Baton Rouge. I was standing up on the levee and shot that particular image. And uh, while I'm on here, um, thanks for the presentation, Al. That was great. Love your images. Do you use uh, any uh, astrophotography apps like photo pills or any of that sort of stuff? Yes, I use, uh, I used to use photo pills. I still use it a little bit, but I've gone to Planet Pro, which uh, to me seems to work better because it's got a virtual viewfinder on it. So right, you can... Uh, you can set your shots and know exactly when and where. Um, I wanted to do a shot of the supermoon rising up the side of Mount Rainier. And it was able to show me a 10 by 10 foot patch of dirt, which was bordered by roads. And uh, I says, okay, I'm gonna take it on faith. So I grabbed my buddy and we went out and we stood on that 10 foot square patch of dirt and I've got a beautiful time lapse of the, mount, the moon rising right up the side of Mount Rainier. Perfect, perfectly followed the side of the mountain. Now that's, that to me, you can't do in photo pills. I, I hear you. I'm gonna have to investigate that. Thanks for the tip.
So you guys are way above the, my head in terms of photography. I'm I'm feeling kind of stupid right now. But anyway, back to the chat. Um, uh, Jeff mentions uh, uh, Google Photos uh, works well for sharing photos. Um, yes, Jeff, that uh, I do use that. But the problem is you can't have an open page. Um, you you have to depend on giving someone the link in order to give them permission to access those photos. So people can't just go there and find the photos on their own unless you've given them the ink, the, the link. Uh, Dropbox uh, was another option that you had mentioned where you can uh, share the photos, but I also do believe the person can't find your photo albums unless they have the link, but maybe someone else can uh, comment further on that if they have experience. I know, uh, uh, Al, you said you don't use cameras uh, that are in uh, cell phones, but my goodness, you see everybody these days uh, taking pictures with their cell phones. Uh, does anybody want to uh, comment on using cell phones for photography? It's a it's a generational thing, I think. Uh, you know, those are computation photography, computational. So the smartphone is running an algorithm, doesn't really have much of what's in the heart and the soul of the photographer and how he feels about the subject. But, you know, my friend's kids who are in their 30s send me photos all the time they're in a dark restaurant and i really couldn't do that with my cameras without a great deal of time and effort okay they're they're sharp multiple exposures and, and all that kind of thing but you know a young friend recently said to me he, he couldn't stand there when i was getting my camera set up to take a group photo and the young friend was mocking me for not using a smartphone because he had to stand there and wait for me to set the camera and he thought it was hilarious and ancient well and i think though uh, a lot of times that those smartphones uh, the newer ones especially are, take really good photos from yeah. my layman's perspective and when you look at a photo uh, you would just say hey it looks great of course, if you lay it side by side to uh, one of your photos, Mike, or one of Al's photos with professional equipment, an experienced eye would certainly see the difference in the level of quality and, and those things you mentioned. But for the average person uh, who's just capturing memories, um, I think to, to a lot of people, the convenience uh, when you're traveling or when you're sightseeing or going to an event if they don't want to be lugging their camera equipment around, they can pull a phone out of their pocket and get a reasonably dis decent photo for, I'm going to say, for family use. Of course, if you're going to print it in a magazine or use it for professional uh, advertising or that sort of thing, that's, that's an entirely different league, way, way beyond at least my it's, photography it's, ability. But uh, I really do think it goes back to the tips that Al has shared in this presentation that a lot of the, the quality of photography has to do with the angle, the lighting, uh, the opportunities that you see if you keep your right. eyes open to, to, find, uh, to find a subject matter or, or, or a view or an angle that really does tell your story. And I, I think that's the foundation of all of this, isn't it? Is that, you know, if you just want to document a trip, you want to document a family event, that's one thing and that's one type of story. If you've got something else interesting to see, you uh, you take it with with the story in mind. And of any takeaways that I have uh, from from Al's presentation is that you know take the photo from the point of view of what is the story you're trying to capture and share, and uh, can you truly make you know that photo worth a thousand words sort of thing. So um, that that's I think the big learning takeaway for me this morning. So uh, last call for questions here. We've uh, run a little bit over time, but it's been very interesting. I want to invite anybody who hasn't commented yet to please come on and, and make their comments or, or share a question. If I, can, if I can make just two quick comments. One is that cell phones are great if you're not going to try and print a large print. I did a, I, I, just as an experiment, I took my cell phone and I shot some Milky Way pictures. Once I started trying to print them over five by seven, the quality went in the toilet. 
So it depends on what you're going to do. If you're just going to share them on social media, they are phenomenal. They're great, but you can't print them very big. Um, the other thing is, is it's the time you take to take a picture that makes a big difference. With cell phone, yes, you can whip it out and go click and you haven't thought about anything. Right. I went, nice. uh, when I was going to an SLR, which was a single lens reflex film camera one day, I had my old view camera with me. I took a picture of a stream uh, next to where we were having a picnic with my, my single lens reflex camera. I went over there and I went, oh, wow, this is great. I went back to the car, got my camera, took my picture and I says, you know, I'm gonna, I wanna blow this up big. So I went and got my, my big view camera and I looked through the view camera and I says, well, look at that. There's a red soda pop can in there. <laughs> so I went and pulled the soda pop can out and I looked through my view camera. There's a piece of plywood. I pulled that out. By the time I got done, I had a pile of junk on the bank and the two pictures were totally different. Yeah. So it's, it's taking the time to look if that's Take what you want. Picture. If you want to just go click, we had a group, share it on social media. A cell phone is a phenomenal tool. Oh, it's interesting, Al. Okay, so uh, Mike, uh, we'll let you have the last uh, word here. You had a comment. Hey, this, is re this is regarding a conversation that's going on on the website, on the, you know, the online chat uh, about the suburban furnace. Have you seen that? It was a topic that was going back and forth for a while. And uh, I don't know if, if everyone's getting these ads like I'm getting, but on my phone, I keep getting these pop-up ads from Suburban announcing core replacement. They use the word core, C-O-R-E. And what they're advertising is, is that you don't have to take the furnace out. You leave it in, but you remove the old core if you're having trouble and put in the new core and supposedly it's more fuel efficient and much quieter. So not only are you able to replace a now not working furnace, but you're gonna put something better in there. And it wasn't a big investment. I think I saw a price of like $600 or something like that. But I was anxious to share that. I well, I wanna thank Al for his great presentation today. Uh, lots of good information, Al, some uh, tips and tricks on how to take good photography. Uh, and also uh, just an amazing uh, sampling of some of the photos you've taken using your road trek, uh, either as the camera bag or as a prop within the photos. <laughs> and uh, so it's great that um, you've been able to share your hobby with us. We thank you so much for taking the time to do that because I know you put a lot of time and effort into creating your uh, PowerPoint presentation. So we uh, do thank you so much for that. And uh, hope that everybody has enjoyed uh, the session today. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.